has been a really um, actually fun weekend for me. Um, Hans Rimshe, as people know, is a, a happy person who likes to laugh and um, tells good stories. You know, so uh, I already feel kind of warmed up for today. You know, people were here um, yesterday or had a chance to do interviews, and I'm sure that's the case too, right? So um, that was a really good visit, and um, he's crisscrossing the country, and um, we'll see him again, you know. Um, <clears throat> well, that was great. So uh, then let's see, other housekeeping is, um, uh, I've asked um, uh, Jen Yeshi Sogyal to be part of the Dorji uh, Kasung, so that's why she's sitting there. Um, because <clears throat> uh, one of our Dorji Kasungs also are um, Umze, right? So thank you. And um, Matthew, and uh, I still, uh, uh, we have a Dorji Kasung person in um, Pennsylvania. So uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Where is the camera? Right here. Which camera are we using? This one? Okay. That one. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, Georgia Kalsang was something that um, uh, Trung Permache uh, initiated uh, in Boulder to help uh, create a safe and orderly environment. Um, uh, help with transportation, help with um, registration, also um, basically be like service. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think he, he was kind of a romantic person. He liked um, King Arthur and the um, Knights of the Round Table and the Knights Hospitaller. I don't know how to pronounce it, you know, the, the crusaders who helped pilgrims like that. So um, uh, Georgia Kalsang has a, a service, basically a service position, right? But they're watching to make sure people um, are uh, okay. And uh, of course, uh, we don't need the title to be um, the activities. So just like noticing, okay, maybe Linda needs a, uh, but foot rest, you know, that's noticing what needs to be done and just do it, right? So that's the activity. Also, I like um, that Dr. Uh, um, is like wearing um, uh, retreat, it's a retreat zen, like white, white is a retreat zen. So some people have heard about um, Milarepa, you know, um, Milarepa used to just wear um, cotton, cotton zen. These are kind of silk usually, right? Can you imagine being at like 15,000 feet and cotton? So he did a lot of tumo, right? You know, he practiced <laughs> so like that. So um, uh, I started um, saying, if you want to wear a, a retreat zen after refuge, uh, this one I had a conversation with Chodun Rimshay many years ago. Uh, I said, you know, we, uh, we're we not quite householders. We're not quite, um, we're not monks or nuns, you know, at least nobody was then. And so we're more like yogis. So uh, if you think it's appropriate, we could wear this yogi zen. So, so he said, okay, like that. <laughs> So that's nice tradition. <clears throat> Pat, Patty was helping me out so much today. She left it in the cottage, probably. She's thinking like, oh my goodness, do I go get mine? No, you don't have to. <laughs> so today's talk briefly, before I introduce Linda, is um, a joy-filled life with unresolved problems. <laughs> So a lot of times people have some misunderstandings about Dharma, um, you know, particularly about um, 
enlightenment or Buddhahood or liberation. And uh, of course, Kansar Ramshi addressed some of those um, misperceptions um, yesterday. Were very good. I'd like to add to that is that um, people think because uh, someone uh, is uh, enlightened or Buddhahood, slightly different meaning somewhat, that in any case, I think then you you don't have any problems. Uh, I'd like uh, to quote from um, 12 Step. Um, uh, when you're in recovery, you have a better set of problems. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> We still have <laughs> we we still have problems, um, but we're approaching them in a different way when we're waking up to the world. <clears throat> and there's still problems in the world, right? But we have a different relationship with problems. <clears throat> and uh, in other words, they're real problems instead of delusional problems. Delusional problem is like, how do I get to like, how, how do I get to have everyone like me all the time? Yeah. <laughs> or how do I get to like myself all the time? That That's that's not actually a real problem because that's a delusion. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, real, real, real problems, uh, you know, are the existential ones that we face with, um, you know, old age with suffering, with death, with conflict. Um, uh, so uh, those uh, in a real way tend to be unresolved, right? On the outside. So um, our practice as bodhisattvas is working um, in a joyful way, joyful effort, sometimes we call it, um, with problems that don't seem to go away because they're they're built into the very nature of existence. <clears throat> so of course, um, I've in fifty more than fifty years, I've gotten to know uh, all my teachers fairly personally, and I'm always asking like, "Well, how you doing?" Uh, and every Lama and Rinpoche or Roshi like has a family, right? didn't just come out of outer space. So uh, I asked the audience here, are there always family problems? Yes, <laughs> of course, right. <clears throat> and are there, are there always health problems? Yes, of course. Are there always um, yeah, money problems? Yes, absolutely. When we think of resources, you know? So <clears throat> it's how, how we relate with them. And um, that's why the, uh, it's so important this weekend that we um, are doing a yoga training and laughter. <clears throat> Sometimes Dharma gets very serious. And I've mentioned in the past when I was living um, in a Zen monastery, uh, Suzaki Roshi, in the middle of um, an intense retreat, um, told everybody to get into their cars and drive down uh, into Claremont. And guess where we went? I've told you before, McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I said, everyone has, you know, you have serious disease. <laughs> and then I was studying at Ropa and I'm doing Zen with Suzaki Roshi too. And when I invited him up to Karmazang, the uh, um, head of Trump Parish, the big building we had bought, um, the administration said, oh, you're here, and you're here to give a guest lecture, and and what are you here to teach? And he said, I didn't come to teach anything, and they got a little serious, <laughs> because we had made a poster and a flyer, so he just said, you know, I, uh, I'm just come to teach people how to laugh. So literally in session, one time he did have us stand up and uh, session is a very rigorous um, week or two week um, program where you get up at three and you go to bed at 10. 
actually for me it sounds kind of normal so that's what i do but um <clears throat> uh once in a while he would get people to stand uh and kind of horse dance you know martial arts and then then you do a belly laugh like that so uh having linda here who's a um a certified laughter yoga instructor uh <laughs> who's very educated um and uh will you know be leading us outside um so it just feels like a, a con continuation of you know um uh what uh you know i learned from the very beginning because um my my various uh teachers like my first interview with Trent Bermshe was um 53 years ago and i said uh like most people, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I just, I just babble and go, my life is full of highs and lows. You know, I'm just having a really hard time. It was probably like, you know, a very bipolar kind of presentation. Um, and then he just laughed. And he said, well, you know, we'll get better if you do some Dharma. At the time, that pissed me off because I took myself very seriously. Also, when... Um, when I had a refuge interview for him with him, um, uh, you know, I, was, I said, blurted it out. I, I, I've been waiting a long time for this because <laughs> I was waiting in line. Like I thought I'd never get in here. Like the line's been really long, and he does. He got hysterical. That that was hugely funny, and as people know, gave me the name Zopa Patience. So. Uh, and I like stand up, you know. So I want to mention this that the laughter yoga and um, a sense of humor is completely in the very center of Dharma path, in the very middle way, particularly in our tradition of Vajrayana and Tantra. It's, it's not something like a little add on, it's, it's completely uh, part of our practice, you know, that we don't have a serious disease. So with that, more I'd like. To say I'm delighted Linda's here and she wants to give a short presentation because uh, then we can be recorded and mic'd and then I'll turn the um, day over to her so she'll be in charge and say when we walk out and what we do. How's that? Yeah, these things are a little tricky. They they look like you should just be, able, but um, for those that wear glasses, it's different, right? You know, it's like okay. You want to use the handheld? That's fine. Okay. No, good. Um, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yes, Techno technology and I have not been having the best week, so I'm going to stick with this one. But fortunately, we've left it off a lot, and um, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm very thankful that um, Doug had found me through um, a, my actual first trainer in laughter as a uh, nurse at UCSF uh, Integral Medicine Department. And uh, Doug has been taking some Zoom classes and we connected. And so I'm really grateful and grateful to Lama Jinpa to have me here. And wow, um, I am ra a rather newbie to Dharma in a sense, but in a sense, I've been here a while. But what I one thing one reason I'm really glad to talk to you about laughter bringing as as bringing you to the doorstep of Dharma is because it, it did happen in my life and um, it has changed my teaching a lot too. So, and I am going to rely on some notes because uh, there's a wonderful exercise we have called, and I suffer from this disease. It's called CRS, can't remember stuff. And we have a wonderful laughter exercise for that where we just laugh it off and it really does free our brain to, to get back to where we were. But um, I will use a few notes because I do have a lot to tell you in this little bit amount of time. So um, um, when you laugh, you change. And when you change, the world changes. That's a quote from my trainer, Dr. Kataria. 
in India. He is the founder of Laughter Yoga. He is a was a medical a Western trained medical doctor in India, married to a yoga teacher. And prior to um, Dr. Kataria developing this program, there had been some of you. I think we're all of the same age that we might remember Norman Cousins. Um, and he was the, actually, I would consider him the father of investigating laughter as a science and a, and a mind body connection because he suffered from an, what they said was an incurable neurological disease, which has been debated as to what it really was. But he was in so much pain, he could not even sleep. And he was told there was no cure and there was nothing he could do. He tried drugs and nothing worked. So he happened to be friends with Alan Front from Candid Camera. and. Had had this belief had been studying a lot of mind body connection, um, and he actually works a little bit in integrative medicine at UCLA. And so he wanted to test out the theory that laughter was the best medicine. So in those days they didn't have videos; they locked themselves in a hotel room and watched films of all kinds of comedy, and you know Marx Brothers, Lucy, anything that made them laugh hysterically. And Norman Cousins found that he could sleep for a couple of hours after a ten minute laughter session. So. You know, 30 years after that, there had been a lot of research. Um, and uh, Norman Cousins actually wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness in the 60s that that um, tells about his journey. And he never died from that disease. He died maybe 15 or 20 years later from another heart issue that he had. But um, he really did um, was considered, I consider him the father of this. Um, and Loma Linda University had a doctor um, named uh, Dr. Fry, and also another Dr. Lee Burke at Stanford. They'd all done research for about 30 years worth of research before this actually started as a form of yoga. And also, the um, I'm, you've all heard of Patch Adams. You've seen that movie. That's another form of laughter. Um, laughter yoga is a little more subtle. We don't, I mean, most of us don't put on funny hats and noses, although in some countries, some people do. That's not my thing. That's not my approach. But, you but you know, there is also an association for therapeutic humor that's been going a long time in the medical profession. So there's lots and lots of research about laughter. Um, laughter yoga is a little bit newer, but um, Dr. Kataria wanted to test it out because he felt that it would be an alternative to a lot of the medication for his patients. And he did, you know, really believe in the mind body Body connection. So he started um, with five people in a group in, at the park that used to walk in Mumbai, and they started telling jokes to make themselves laugh. They weren't quite sure how to do this. And it about 50 people finally came, but then suddenly they were running out of jokes, and the jokes were becoming offensive. And people were like, we're not coming back. And I actually met in, in one of my classes, I met someone who had been to that class, which was from India, which was really neat. Um, and so he said, well, wait a minute, just come back tomorrow, I, I will sort this out. And what he did was go to his lovely wife, Madhuri, who's a yoga teacher. And they realized that, you know, that the laughter, scientifically laughing, um, our brain doesn't know the difference between real laughter and simulated laughter. So they decided to just have unconditional laughter. Well, the great thing about this is it doesn't rely on jokes or comedy. Often jokes and com are in comedy are subjective, but they're often not kind, right? If you've ever sat in front of a row of Rodney Dangerfield or something like that, you're like, oh, please, you know, don't don't pick on me. So there are a lot of people that are shy about laughter because of that. So I think this was a really important step. And they started with yoga exercises like the lion pose, um, different, and they incorporated two yogic breaths. We use pranayama and we use the, our laughter version of the kapalabhati or breath of fire, which is a little bit different, but we'll learn that. So basically, that was how laughter yoga began. And I think they learned a lot of things from that first from that first journey. But basically, we train ourselves to laugh unconditionally without jokes or humor. And I found in my work that so many people who have been bullied have a little bit of an aversion to laughter. We all think we can laugh, but not everyone can laugh boisterously and on cue. So we have to have to ease into it gently. Um, it's a direct, it's, I, we think of it as kindergarten for grownups. We want to be more like kids. Kids laugh hundreds of times a day. They use their bodies. They have no filter. And so we want to we want to create that playfulness and that um, in our in our activities. So we use a lot of eye contact and we use a lot of um, playfulness in our exercises, which are basically improv exercises that we start with all these exercises that we've learned. But a lot of us turn it into 
whatever group we're working it with, whatever those issues are that I just taught at Davis. I teach there, um, I'm on their wellness staff. Thank you, Davis, for understanding that mindfulness is a part of wellness, okay? <laughs> and so I, um, yeah, we can we can fine tune it to whatever are our issues that we are that we are trying to you know raise raise ourselves above. And laughter is a great way to just push those out. So um, we also combine it with the two yoga breaths that I mentioned. And because we're doing that, we're bringing more oxygen to the brain. Um, we're getting our we're improving our circulation. We have a sheet that I will give you at the end that has all the benefits of all the physiological and psychological benefits of laughter, which are many. Um, but the main ones I think are important are the healthy hormones that we get from laughter. And we get, we reduce our cortisol. We actually get endorphins, just like we're working out. We get dopamine because the more you laugh, the more you laugh. It's cool. Let's do it more. We get serotonin. We get oxytocin. And all these things are from daily practice. It's great to do it once, but it is like anything else. It's a daily practice of mind and body. So... Uh, my background was actually, my undergrad work was in psych sociology, and I minored in psychology. But back in the dinosaur days when I graduated in the 73, um, we didn't have positive psychology. Psychology, and it's still, in some degrees, is more about saying that people are, need to be cured and how we're going to fix them. And um, so that, when I first discovered positive psychology, for myself, I was really impressed with the concept. It was the Seligman's book, Authentic Happiness. And it was like the idea of happy buttons. It was like, that's just great. You know, that he had he'd had a stressful morning and he hadn't even noticed his child playing on the floor. And when he got to work, he had all these stickers on his shoes. And it just made him so joyful. And um, I, my background was also, you know, I had been a Montessori teacher. And so that was kind of my spiritual training. I, it was a very spiritual experience because Marie Montessori not only was the first medical doctor in, um, in, um, at that time in Italy, uh, she was a Catholic, but she had a really different perspective in that children were born innately good and with goodness and kindness. And all we had to do was nurture it. That was that was, and her day in that time was really quite uh, groundbreaking. And so um, the thing I loved about Montessori education is that it was education for peace. And it was um, respect and reverence for nature and all beings in the world and the beauty in the world. And kids weren't graded, so they would help one another. And so that was a, it was really a great type of learning. And so when I discovered laughter yoga, I was like, wow, this is so close to what I did with children, but it's really for adults. So that's kind of where I came from. And the main thing that impressed me about laughter yoga is the, is the idea about serotonin. And um, most of you probably know, but I mean, obviously serotonin is in all the, the mood lifting drugs that are out there being prescribed to lots of people. And um, it's a neurotransmitter that mod modulates our mood, our, our cognition, our reward center, learning, memory. And what I learned in laughter yoga is that it's stored in our belly. And so we're bringing it up from our belly to our brain. And laughter is the easiest, effortless way to do that. Um, there are other ways that we can do it. And that's why I like to teach outside because light and exercise and music and meditation, um, gratitude, positivity, Affectionate touch, those are all the things that boost our serotonin. And the cool thing about serotonin is it has a cycle. The more you make, and you know this, the more you make, the more you make people happy, the happier you are, and the more you want to make people happy. And um, that's the beautiful thing about serotonin because laughter gives us that. And for me, that understanding that joy was in the belly of each of us and that we, we all have an innate tool to release it, um, was something that I wanted to focus in my classes because laughter is the universal language of joy and everyone can understand that. But there's all, you know, happiness and joy, you know, in, in Western world, our, our concept of happiness is very circumstantial. You know, it's about the stories we tell ourselves and who we think we're supposed to be. And if we didn't do all those things right, we're not happy. And so getting people to understand that joy is everywhere and it's accessible through laughter and it's okay to laugh and all the in and the ups and downs in life, um, it's kind of you know it was the first step to understanding 
that happiness is accepting all things equally. And I already knew that before I got exposed to, to Dharma. But when I met my wonderful partner, Patrick, um, about four years ago, I started um, listening to talks from his Sangha. And every time I heard a Dharma talk, I was like, this is great. I'm going to add this to my, I'm going to add this to my class, you know? And then there were times he goes, he'd come to my class and he goes, but you, you are doing that. You know, it's like, and so it just was this great, you know, light bulb moment that this is what I'm doing, even though it was somewhat unconscious. But once I realized it, I started bringing more things in. If we had a, a talk about um, benevolent gestures, we'd make up an exercise about that. Um, I have an exercise we might do today about welcoming discomfort. You know? <laughs> and so all those things that I'd learned in the Dharma talks, I was able to put into my classes and come, you know, this was before our pandemic, but once we switched to Zoom and I was running a support group for people during the pandemic, I actually combined my LGBTQ group and my senior group to one group and people were obviously stressed and, and very emotional. And we just, you know, made up all the exercises that we need to that we needed to make up to understand that we could still be joyful. And even before that, when I would teach during a fire or doing an awful time, people would come to class and say, "Oh, is it okay to laugh?" You know, and it's like, yes, it is okay to laugh. There, there is even grief yoga where people are trained to use laughter yoga to help with grief. So um, there was also a. Um, I think what I wanted to say is in the middle of our session, we do a, a giggle meditation and it's just laughing. It's just letting it out of our body after we've practiced. And um, it teaches us what true emptiness is because when you're laughing boisterously, there's no room for anything else. There really isn't. And um, our mind is empty and there's no room for our ego, our critical mind, negative thoughts, greed, jealousy. It's just, it, it just pushes it out. It's like, it, Physiologically, there's just not room. And the, the, when uh, um, John Cleese went to India in 2010 uh, to, to experience laughter yoga, and there's a clip of him somewhere that just cracks me up because he just says, when you're laughing hysterically with people, I think he says you don't want to kill them. But, you know, you don't want to harm them. You just, you don't, you can't. It's just not possible. And so that's what I think is, is the really important thing about laughter. And um, Loma Linda University that I mentioned before, in 2014, they did a study just on joyful laughter. And they, it produced an abundance of gamma brain waves similar to those of people who are daily meditators. And that, that uh, research has been circulating for a while. But um, so in our class, we, we end with a loving kindness meditation and a willingness to be more open-hearted. And I definitely took that from a Dharma talk and just changed my ending. <laughs> we had another ending, but I like that better. And, you know, we're spreading positive emotions, love and compassion. And so my question for you is, I hope that you will come outside and experience this for yourself. But my question for you is that is the upward spiral we feel from all that serotonin created by laughter um, really the experience of our own true Buddha nature? I think it is, but the proof is in the pudding. And I think when you experience it, it's a really quick transformation. It's a really great way to just get your mind empty and 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 get your Buddha nature immediately, whether you realize that you're getting it or not. And so that's why I love my work because it's great to be with a group that understands it from that perspective. But even if they don't, they feel great and they're getting it. And so um, a good laughter session feels, uh, leaves us feeling present, available, and optimistic, and able to see that daily practice has a huge impact on how we see the world and everybody around us. So in my, in my, in my opinion, it drops us off at the door of Dharma. And so um, I hope that you will try, try it out for yourself, test it out for yourself today, and come outside. And let's see what time we have here. Oh, good. We have a little time for stretching or whatever before we do that. Um, it's a very gentle, it, I call it laughter wellness sometimes. It is yoga because it is the concept of unity. And Dr. Kataria created it as a form of yoga. Because I think because he wants to spread it to the world, it's, it's, there are yoga, laughter yoga groups everywhere in the world, just about. And thousands and thousands of them you can it's a universal language you can go to any country and find a laughter group and because we use vowel sounds like a and e and do these exercises you could you'll be very comfortable just doing it anywhere and so um 
I don't, it's nothing that, there are no asanas and there are no poses, which makes it wonderful because I've worked in dementia facilities and skilled nursing in medical, you know, anyone it, it can, can do it. Um, if you choose to sit outside, you can, if you want to stand, our number one rule is no new pain. My number two rule is no left brain. And the number three rule is be kind. So that's pretty much it. And we will do a little bit of a warm up. We do some, we do clapping and chanting using our acupressure points. So we're doing a, quite a few things to, to boost our serotonin and to help us be more focused and relieve our pain. And then we, I'll teach you the yogic breaths and we do a little bit, a lot of music and movement. And, but it's very, very simple on your body. So I'm recovering from a knee replacement three months out. And if I could do this, <laughs> Anyone could do this. And it's great because as we age in stage, not all of us can get on the floor and do yoga, but we want that spiritual experience. And it, it's just a wonderful way, and, and certainly during the pandemic, to connect with other humans. In my Montessori training, eye contact was the most important thing. We would get down at eye level and say good morning to every child and make that eye contact. And that's the wonderful thing about laughter is that we are connecting with our faces. And that's what we have in common and all other things do not matter. So I'm really very, very grateful, Doug, for finding me and uh, bringing me here and to Lama Jimpa to uh, let your um, folks here experience in that. I'm, I'm very excited to share it with you. So I hope that you will all try it and I will have some little, my little sheet at the table outside so that you can get a little bit more background about it and all the psychological and physiological benefits. And I can provide that on a PDF for people who are listening if they'd like to have that as well. So much gratitude. Thank you so much. And I hope that you will choose to, um, in, I will hope that you will choose to test it out for yourself in a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. So uh, maybe a short question. I definitely have time for questions. Am I back on? Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want you in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and I'm the same way. And sometimes I laugh at things that it's my, it, it's actually my way of releasing stress. And even before laughter yoga, uh, well, probably since laughter yoga, it more, it more is. And it, it is because laughter and breathing, when we talk about the Kapalabhati breath, which is the ha ha ha, it's used a lot in recovery. It's a quick way to just, um, you know, reprogram yourself. So a lot of times when we laugh, it, we're laughing at something that's uncomfortable too. And I do that. And I, you know, there was one case where my son said he, you know, he'd split up with his girlfriend and I, and I did an uncomfortable laugh and it really upset him. And I realized, I realized that that's what I do when I'm uncomfortable kind of to calm myself. So there is kind of a balance, but I think the world needs a lot of boisterous laughter laughers because not everyone can do that. We ease into it, but some people are, you think that everyone can laugh, but I've actually met people that can't. And so I, I, um, if it's, if you have to monitor it, you know, in, in certain places, then I think that's important, but to be joyful anywhere, I think the main thing is that we are being kind and that we're laughing at things that, that, that we're laughing at things that reflect kindness. Does that make sense? My thing is, you know, I want to be sensitive to where, where people are at and meet them where they're at. You know, I've been working on like communication and like, you know, that's been the biggest thing, you know, because I, I have never known how to communicate. And um, and so I've been thinking about this a lot because um, my sister actually told me she's like, yeah, and that laugh you have, you know, that 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 fake laugh. And I was like, it hurt my feelings so bad. But then at the same time, I had to think about it. Because she's right, you know, I would, you know, like, I just start laughing and you know, it's not really that funny. 
well, sometimes. But it's know. not really, it sounds like it's not really a fake laugh, though. It's it, I don't feel like it's a uh -huh. fake laugh. I'm a giggler, uh -huh. you know, um, and I love laughing. But also, I don't, you know, I want to be sensitive to my right. friends. I want to be a better friend and, you know, and that kind of thing. Right. So you might have to try to replace that with some words in some in some situations. I think I've, I've met a lot of people who are traumatized by, by laughter because they have been bullied. So that's one thing with people. If you just, you know, if you don't know them and you laugh, that they do misinterpret it sometimes. And, and that's true. So you might want to just use a little bit more words before you're in a situation. You know, when you're comfortable with someone, then it's great to just get into you know i mean we we aim for 15 minutes of laughter a day so you know it's not lying on the floor giggling but basically in in between breathing and in your day so um i think it's just a question like anything else of balance right but thank you for that yes no no i just mean some people's interpretation that they may have some inner things that you don't understand because i've come across that in class the, the only people that i've met that have been scared of laughter are people who have it's it, have had trauma um, and people laugh at them for whatever reasons. So that's one thing to consider in the balance. But thanks for that question. Anybody else have questions? Oh, he's going to give you a mic. Because we're Zooming. Thank you. you. You said that the brain know or don't know the difference between fake and real no our nervous system responds the same way from laughter whether it's because it's something funny or because we just initiate it so once we go out there and we start laughing it does when we especially when we do our meditation um it is contagious and it becomes real but for some people who don't who are kind of just wading into it it doesn't have to be a genuine laugh and basically because we're not using jokes um, it's just that we're training ourselves and, and using our diaphragm. And the, and the key to that is that our, our sympathetic nervous system, which isn't so sympathetic, is our fight or flight, right? And we tense up and we don't breathe. But when we start to use our breathing techniques, then we're able to calm down that sympathetic and move over to the parasympathetic and the part of our brain, the amygdala, you know, that, that lets us calm down. And that's where we get our compassion and, you know, all the, the, the good, um, the good traits that we're, we're, that we get from laughter and, and our Buddha nature. But when we are, you know, so tight and stressed and not breathing, that's, that's what happens. But if we initiate the laughter and the breathing, whether we feel it or not, our, it's, our nervous system still responds the same way. And that's what they found in all this research. So that's what's really interesting about that. And we'll do some, you can feel horrible in the morning and you can get yourself laughing. It's, it's really easy to do that um, because it's, it's, it is, a lot of it is physiology. You, you think also the laughing can open the door for crying? Yes, yes, it can. And we do a, we do a winding down at the end of our, um, after our meditation, because 95% of people feel energized and better but when we've relaxed our nervous system sometimes things we were holding back and not even thinking about come out and there there are two sides of the same but it's okay to laugh and cry at the same time too and you know and um but it it generally 95 percent of the time we feel joyful but there are things that do come up because we've because we've let our um we've calmed our nervous system down so yeah that's a good question thank you thank you all right, I'm having fun with questions anymore. <laughs> Good questions. Okay. I, I have one last question. Oh. Zoom question. question. Excellent. Well, while we're waiting, maybe. Uh, then you can come back or do uh, just a Zoom class because we have a significant, um, you know, uh, video presence too, right? So they won't they won't be outside with us, uh, unfortunately. So I'll talk about that uh, about that with you later. Okay, so maybe yes, I've, uh, we've got we've got a lot of Zoomies out there. I've been Zooming a lot, but it's really great to have real people and faces yeah. because it's yeah. all about. 
I, although Zoom has been a wonderful way during the pandemic to connect because we could still see faces on the screen. We didn't have to have our masks. So in that sense, it really was. But there's a kind of energy that you get when you're in person and in a group and the whole collective energy of laughter and the reason it's contagious, you know, is it's really great to be outside and in person. So I'm excited. Did you find Sharon? Did we find the question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, Sharon, if you want to try to talk from Zoom. Maybe, I don't know, if you can. I was just wondering if there was any physiological difference between the laughter that you do from a joke versus the laughter from yoga. Nope. It's really not. And if you and if you are enjoying a good joke or a good TV show and you can keep the laughter going with some of the exercises that we do to keep it going longer, I highly recommend that. It's the, it's the physiology of it. No, but the thing about laughter is that we're trying to do it in a kind way because that will appeal to everyone. And, and, and jokes don't, I mean, I'm a big, I do comedy and I can be very sarcastic and I like all kinds of comedy, but that's not, not what, that's not what makes everyone comfortable. So in laughter, we're just, it's all about being kind and making it accessible to everybody. But this laughter physiologically is the same, um, but it's great to keep it going if you can. Does that answer you. your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Just a quick comment, comment. When I was around 11 years old, my brother, who's about three and a half years older than myself, would gather the four of us in a circle. And he said, let's just, let's just go ha, ha, ha and laugh. And within two to three minutes, we were laughing hysterically just from right. nothing funny, but just from that, that exercise. Right. That's yeah. the contagious. You discovered the contagious nature of laughter. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I have one, one quick story to this. Uh, what, uh, someone came up to me at a conference once and told me a story about um, having um, been camping at a very, very high altitude and suddenly uh, was hyperventilating and, and did not what, know what to do and just started running down the mountain and um, gasping for air. And his friend, he was, then he turned around because his friend was yelling and hauling all the camping gear in the tent and everything down the mountain and trying to figure out what, like, what was happening, what catastrophe was he averting. And he said when he saw that, he just fell to the ground and could not stop laughing. And guess what? He was breathing, right? And, and, and he was fine. That's one of my favorite stories about laughter. So I guess we can maybe end with that. And, and I don't know if you take a break before we go outside or if we will just be going outside. We can just go outside. Okay, so yeah. um, if you feel like sitting, that's great. If you want to stand and stretch, we'll be doing a little gentle stretching, whatever. It's, it's totally adaptable. And, uh, and our main rule is don't do anything that hurts. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Linda. Omo araya pasaya na aindi Om araya pasaya na